Um, you're all very welcome to uh, tonight's Zoom. It's um, an online, online presentation and conversations around Kathleen and Brown. Um, this is part of a project that the North Wexford Traditional Singing Circle are doing as part of the Decade of Centenaries and uh, supported by Wexford County Council. And the project brief really is to um, compose a song in the traditional style and um, film, do some filming of that song um, at places relevant to Kathleen's story, really. So tonight we're delighted to have um, Dr. Mary McAuliffe, uh, the Director of Gender Studies at UCD, um, who is going to give us a presentation on Kathleen today. And um, the idea is that we will have, after the presentation, we will, we will have um, a question and answer session. And we would love, I know there's lots of family members of Kathleen here. Um, in the room, so it would be nice to have some input from them too. And, and I suppose this is a, um, a meeting of um, discussion and learning research really into Kathleen so that we can collate all the information and um, make sure that the song is telling the story um, of Kathleen's life. And um, so, yeah, so that's, we'll get started. Um, I'm delighted to hand over to, to Mary, who's going to um, spend the next um, while explaining and, and um, presenting um, the life of Kathleen um, A. Brown. So I'll hand over to you, Mary, and thank you so much for, for coming along this evening. It's all my pleasure. And <clears throat> just how long uh, do I have to, have I got to talk? What do I have to talk? <laughs> well, it, Would you say? It, it, I don't know. Half hour, 45 minutes, is, is that okay, okay with you? Really? Yeah. There's lots to say about Kathleen, so yeah. Well, yes. Well, the better, I suppose, in terms of the 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 song. So yeah, absolutely, we'd love to um hear what you have to say about Kathleen. We're so yeah. I'm I'm absolutely absolutely delighted to be here with you all this evening. Um, uh, I suppose in many ways I've been uh, working on on people like women, particularly like Kathleen Brown, for the last decade, decade and a half. And I think I published the book on Kathleen in um, 2009, 2010. Uh, and, and in many ways, she was the first one I did a deep dive into of these revolutionary and political women. Uh, and since then, I've been going through the decade of centenaries, looking at an awful lot of these revolutionary women. And Kathleen's always been part of that. And uh, as we move on, though, from the decade of centenaries, what many are now advocating is the importance of researching and analysing revolutionary afterlives. I mean, Kathleen doesn't begin and end with 1916, or indeed the War of Independence or Civil War, and then stop, which is often what we find in our history books with these women. Um, uh, but how do they fit into this counter-revolutionary, conservative, patriarchal free state, which is dominated by an alliance of church and state, they had fought, of course, for the 1916 proclamation and the full and equal citizenship that had been proclaimed in that. And indeed that Kathleen was friendly with, with numerous members of the revolutionary male generation, particularly Arthur Griffith, um, and uh, knew a lot of the women like Maura Comerford, like Alice Stopford Green, like Mrs. She Skeffington, whom she her letters to in the She Skeffington archive. Um, and so that promise of equal citizenship was very, very important to them. And I think it's it's worth remembering because, of course, Kathleen becomes a political uh, player in the new Irish Free State as Senator Kathleen May Brown. And I want to look in, in, in a little bit of a detail as we go through the paper on the Senate women and Kathleen's place within uh, those first two decades of the Irish Free State. Of course, she does run for the 1925 Senate election, but she isn't elected. She comes in in 29. Uh, and what do they do? Uh, and uh, because they're working within what Mary Ann Valoulis called a very domestic state. She said, clearly male political leaders saw women only in domestic terms. Women were mothers, women were wives, women minded hearth and home. And she writes that the ideal woman was also passive, particularly for De Valera once he comes to power in 32. She did no work of her own. She fulfilled the wishes of her sons or brothers or husbands. And all this bespeaks an air of self-effacement, of meekness, of indirectness. I can think you could not say that about Kathleen Brown. 
So how does Kathleen Brown overcome the sort of domestication of Irish womanhood um, and this glorification of motherhood, although she does become uh, a, an adoptive mother of her nieces and nephews and brings them up with her sister um, in their home in Rathnonan. Uh, how do we see this conservatism as a response to the War of Independence and the bitter conflicts of the Civil War, which Kathleen experienced? And how do we see how she tried to root for women, to help women, even though this domestication, this, this second class citizenship and this dominance of the ideology uh, of church and state, uh, which, you know, define the respectable Irish woman, where does Kathleen fit in there? And where does she fit in with this demand for full citizenship? Why did she uh, become part of the blue shirts, the blue blouses? She was a major leader in there, where other women were left wing, she remains more centre right. Uh, but she's not the only one who does that. Uh, and I think it is very interesting to look at all the afterlives of these women. Women she knew, like Kathleen Lynn, who went and founded St. Alton's Hospital. Hannah Shee Skeffington, who continued to agitate for women's rights. Maura Comerford, who remained a left-wing uh, agitator. Mar Margaret Skinner, another woman I wrote on, um, whom, uh, you know, she would have known as well, um, becomes a, a teacher and a member of the INTO and a trade union activist. So they're all going in their different ways, uh, trying to, um, I suppose, find a path for women among this very uh, a state dominated by the ideology of respectability for Irish women, um, which Anne Dolan said was it could be a cruel and exacting king, uh, given the bold reality that, as she writes, Magdalen laundries, industrial schools, institutions of all sorts were there for those who transgressed. Uh, and, and as a politician, Kathleen had to deal with that. She's also part of uh, the um, legislation, the legislative process that she resisted of militant Catholicism, but also she was part of it um, as well in that she was a, a woman who believed in, um, she was anti-communist. So that's kind of an introduction of why it's important to look at these women, because I think without understanding their positioning within the new Irish Free State and why they were political women, we don't really fully understand the whole history of the Irish Free State. We're simply getting the male centred part of it, but also why women were treated as they were treated in the Free State and then on into the Republic. So start with Kathleen. She talks about her revolutionary activities. Um, in the beginning, she was very much part of the Ambulance Corps, learning first aid. She's in coming them on, making flags to be carried by the volunteers, classes for women in first aid, services they could render the volunteers as patriotic Irish women, they would do any work uh, of, of uh, any intense delight came to them. So what motivated Kathleen Brown? Where did she come from? Out of what, uh, you know, background does she come from? What led to her involvement in the Greek League? and organizing classes in early 1900, to Kilmainham Jail in 1916, to the Senate in 1929, to the Army Comrades Association uh, and uh, um, uh, Come in the Gael in the early 1930s, to resistance to the uh, misogynist legislation that was introduced, to being a woman who ran a farm, and that was very important to her. She always called herself a practical farmer. Being the practical farmer was very important. She participated in almost all the revolutionary movements of the early 20th century from the Gaelic League. Of course, she was an expert in Yola, as well as in Irish. Yola being uh, the, the um, uh, language spoken down in South Wexford. She was in Sinn Féin. She was in, she says the Irish volunteers, although women weren't allowed to join, but a few women said they were associated with the volunteers. She was in Common Amman, Common the Searsha, Common the Goyle, the Army Comrades Association, the National Guard or blue shirts, blue blouses, as the women were called, and Fine Gael. She was a romantic nationalist. For a very practical woman, she had that sense of romanticism. She wrote books. 
she participated in the rising. She went to prison for her beliefs. She subsequently was active in the War of Independence. She supported the treaty. The Civil War left her, as with many, with a fierce bitterness to those who rejected the treaty and who denied that the Irish Free State should exist. As a politician, she was very active in the promotion of rights of farmers, particularly farm women. And I think that's very important because farm women in many ways were sidelined. They, they were dependent on the income in the farm. They had no independent income except for a small pittance they would get from egg money from making cheese or selling um, maybe some milk in the farm. And she made sure that was not taxed by the government. As a politician, she was active in the promotion of the, uh, the rights of farm women and those she felt were vulnerable. She was an environmentalist before environmentalism really becomes an issue. She was very much involved in creating and protecting the Great Salty Islands. She was an avid historian who demanded that the state play its part in protecting our national heritage. She wrote, of course, books on Cromwell and various others that were used in schools. As a countrywoman and farmer, she was always agitating for the rights of rural workers, the landless labourer, the farmer, uh, and the protection of business and rural industries. And she was very much involved in the beet industry, for example, in Carlow and Wexford. In a letter containing a, a list of her achievements, to the, uh, which is in the Department of the Taoiseach, she writes in 1925, and this is after the War of Independence, she was just 50 years old then, and her list of achievements is impressive and exhaustive by any standard. She described herself as a practical farmer managing a mixed farm of 170 acres successfully. She was branch secretary of Common the Royal in Wexford and a local peace commissioner. She was a member of the Irish Farmers Union, the Wexford Agricultural Society, and a member of the managing committee of the Loch Gorman Cooperative. Uh, you know, this was a busy, busy woman. She was also bringing up children in her home with her sister. She'd always been a joiner, a worker. She wasn't somebody who just joined something. She got onto committees, often becoming the president or the secretary. She was a keen horsewoman. We've seen wonderful pictures of that and promoted hunting as a national sport. She spent seven years lecturing in dairying in the under the Department of Agriculture and had an extensive knowledge of forestry and the promotion of afforestation for both industry. Kathleen could exist today, actually, in, in today's world in many ways, her environmentalism, her knowledge of forestry. I wonder what she would make, actually, of, of, of climate change today and how she would work in that. <laughs> she joined the Gaelic League in 1909, and it was probably her first introduction to her own politics. But we also have to look at the family she came from, Sorry, Mary. Um, sorry for interrupting you. Could I ask you to make the screen and um, the slides in full screen, please? Oh, yeah, from the beginning. Great. Sorry. Thank you. Yeah. Okay. I can see them better now, too. Um, I didn't realise they weren't in, in full screen. Of course, her father, who was a great influence in her life, had been involved in the Home Rule Movement and in um, the Land League. Um, and in working around that area. So she had come from a family that her politics uh, were always part of the um, uh, family, I suppose, occupation. She was always Miss, Ronan, uh, Miss Kathleen Brown of Rath Ronan Castle, as she styled herself. Um, her father, Michael of Bridgetown and Rath Ronan was a member of the Land League, as I said, and involved in the land war in Wexford. He letters, letters remain in the Irish, in the family archive, which were kindly shared with me by both Des and Bernard Brown, Des Walsh and Bernard Brown, when I was writing on Kathleen Brown. And letters remain in that archive from Isaac Butt, from Anna Parnell, Michael Davitt, John Dillon, among others. Oral histories speak about visits from Charles Stuart Parnell and John Redmond, of course, she was very friendly with John Redmond to the family home at Bridgetown. Michael Brown had been a poor law, uh, member of the Poor Law Gar um, uh, Board of Guardians and elected member of Wexford County Council and had served in that body from 1898 until 1912. He was, she said herself, well known for his lifelong labours in every national movement from the days of Isaac Butt of the Home Rule to those of the Gaelic League 
uh, and for his distinguished service on public boards for his country and county. He's especially remembered, as she would be herself, as a friend of the working classes, particularly the farm labourers, when they had no organisation of their own to further their interests. Brown's and her mother's family, the Saffords, of course, were all descendants of Anglo-Normans who had come to Wexford with the Anglo-Norman invasion of the 12th century. And they were very proud of that Anglo, that Nor Cambro-Norman, Hiberno-Norman heritage. Um, and that can, and, and of what had happened to them during Cromwellian era when they had been uh, lost their lands and getting their lands back uh, was a very important aspect of their uh, family story which was a very interesting thing that they managed to get back so much of their lands. Kathleen herself seems to have begun political activism at a very young age as in the archive is a membership card for six-year-old Kathleen of the Ladies' Land League in 1881, Anna Parnell's Ladies' Land League. So her CV shows a deep commitment to Ireland and particularly to the romantic nationalism of the early 20th century and an abiding interest in Irish history culture, land, uh, language, um, and of course, the, uh, the concept of freedom for Ireland. She, um, I'm sorry, this is the war flu. Her, her arrest in 1916, she's a member of Common Amon. Um, she doesn't actually participate in the rising itself. She is in South Wexford at Rathmunen. Uh, and the story is that she raised a flag, a tricolour, over the castle um, and she was arrested by um, when they did a sweep around the countryside. She didn't manage to get to Enniscorty to join the rebellion there. Neither did her friend, Nell Ryan of Tom Pool, of the Ryan sisters of Tom Pool. Very interesting crowd of Wexford sisters as well. They were both arrested and taken off to Waterford Prison and then they were transferred to um, Dublin where she was imprisoned with Nell and various other members of the Common Amon who had been out in 1916, firstly in Richmond Barracks and then on Mount Joy Jail. Interestingly, many of the women who were actually in the Rising, who had been arrested, weren't, um, were released after about 10 days, but Kathleen stays in Mount Joy Jail for quite a few uh, weeks. Uh, she stays as long as many of the senior leaders. So she would have been in there with Countess Markovich, uh, with Kathleen Lynn, with Nell and um, uh, Kish Ryan, um, and with, with various other Madeleine French Mullen, and with various other senior leaders, uh, women leaders of um, 1916. And we have letters from her uh, writing home to her brothers and sisters, and it just showed the, the measure of her as she wrote home to her mother, telling her about what was going on in the prison in Mount Joy and asking her to send certain you know, food stops um, to keep them, they're not being fed well. And she was very worried about um, um, Kit Ryan's psychological state in prison, although she said in a subsequent letter that uh, they'd gotten a visit, so Kit was feeling better. Uh, she wrote some letters to Alice Stockford Green. So you can see the interconnections that Kathleen has. She's not an outlier. She's not an unknown person. She's a well-known person within cultural uh, and nationalist politics at this time uh, and she knows many of the leaders. She would continue to be involved in Common Amal and uh, through the War of Independence Rathronan was a place, a safe house, a place where arms and ammunition were kept. Uh, she did what many of the women in Common Amal did during the War of Independence. Uh, she provided space of safety for those who were on the run, uh, catering for men on the run, those who needed uh, help medically or, or just clean clothes, dry clothes. You have to remember a guerrilla army is getting wet. Trench foot is a big problem. Uh, so the women are providing an invaluable service. Um, I, I, I really dislike when people said, oh, women did what came within their domestic chores. They're the catering core of the guerrilla army. They're the medical core of the guerrilla army. They're the dispatch carriers. They're the intelligence gatherers. So without them, uh, the um, active service units and the flying columns would not have been able to do what they did in various parts of the country. When it came in 1921, when um, the, the treaty was being decided, Kathleen comes down pro-treaty. 
and she's vehemently pro-treaty. She, she accepts the stepping, star, star, stepping stone argument um, of Collins and others who want uh, the treaty to be accepted, that it is the freedom to accept freedom. And I think in many ways as well, so many people like Kathleen had had enough of violence. You know, they had seen a lot of violence, reprisals and raids. When you think about it, 50,000 houses raided in 1920, more um, would have been more going into 1921. Women often suffered because of those reprisal raids because they're the ones who were in the homes. They aren't on the run. So when the soldiers come up the driveway and raid the house at night, it is the women and children that they are pulling out of beds and the older people. And oftentimes that was, was accompanied by physical violence and psychological violence and sometimes um, sexualized and gendered violence uh, committed on these women. So a lot of violence had led people to think we're getting this now, but also it was more than home rule and fam uh, Kathleen's family had been a home rule family. Here, what was being offered through the treaty was more than home rule. It was self-governance for Ireland, okay, within um, the empire, within the Commonwealth, with an oath of allegiance, but again, stepping stone to achieve freedom. So she leaves Common Amon, Common Amon split on the treaty. They have a meeting in February 1922. And I suppose in many ways, it's important to mark that split in Common Amon because all of these women were comrades. They had all fought together. They all knew each other. They had been in prison together. They had suffered together. They had collaborated together. And now they split. And the civil war is not just a war brother against brother. It is also a war sister against sister. And I, in one of the examples I use when I talk about that sister against sister split is the relationship between Nell Ryan and Kathleen Brown, who were best friends, who knew each other so well, who had been taken off from Waterford Prison up to Mount Joy Jail and then uh, imprisoned together in 1916, who collaborated and probably met a lot during the War of Independence. Nell Ryan is vehemently anti-treaty. There's also a split, of course, within her own family. Her sister Min is married to Richard Mulcahy, who's the Army Chief of Staff of the Free State Army and then Minister for Defence. Um, and she, Nell, ends up in, in Kilmainham jail and going on hunger strike and almost dies because of her anti-treaty stance. Kathleen leaves Common Amman and with many others becomes a founder member of Common Assertia. Common Assertia is set up as a pro-treaty women's group. And what Common Assertia does is similar to what Common Amman had done during the War of Independence. Uh, initially, before the civil war breaks out into full violence, they campaign for pro-treaty candidates in the June election. Basically, the, the general election is a treaty referendum. <coughs> and Kathleen would have been able to vote in that referendum, as would have Nell. They were over 30. Interestingly, what people forget is the treaty election, the June election, was carried out under the conditions of female voting that was granted in 1918 only women over the age of 30 with certain property qualifications could vote. Even though women like Kathleen, um, uh, Hannah Shee Skeffington, Kathleen Lynn, Maura Comerford, Kate O'Callaghan, whose husband had been killed, the mayor of Limerick during the War of Independence, went to Collins and Griffith and wanted the um, electoral roll updated so all women over the age of 21 could vote. There was a fear that young women were anti-treaty and, and not an unqualified uh, fear. Many of the young common Amman women were under uh, were anti-treaty, although I think the treaty would have passed anyway, that, uh, that uh, the pro-treaty organizations, pro-treaty would have won, maybe not by as much as they did, but they probably would have won anyway. So Kathleen campaigns for pro-treaty um, men to be elected. And they were all the anti-treaty women, the six women TDs, all lose their seats. Um, and, and so now you have a situation where the Irish Free State is set up. You have a standoff. The um, four courts were taken over in April by the radical uh, wing, I suppose, of the IRA, the anti-treaty IRA, Lee Mellows, Rory O'Connor and others. And pressure comes on the new government, now a pro-treaty government, settling in as the new government of the Irish Free State, 
treaty has been accepted, they've taken their oath of allegiance, and the battle for Dublin breaks out late after the election, in late June, early July of 1922, and now we're into civil war. And civil war is a very bitter war. It's different, all wars are horrible, but civil war is particularly horrible. And I think for, for Kathleen and others like her, that split in both the, the organization of which she was a member, coming a man, and the split down the middle of the IRA led to a real trauma and a bitterness that remained for all of her life. And indeed, she's not the only one that has remained within. And particularly between her, herself and Nell. And I think it's important to recognize those afterlives of women. At one stage, she writes a letter that's in the family archive talking about the threats from the anti-treaty IRA because she's so obviously pro-treaty and a member of Common the Sirsha. They tried to burn out many of the Common the Sirsha women. Uh, Jenny Wise Power, a founder member of Common Amman, her home and her businesses were firebombed. And so Kat, or Kathleen says, we were saved from being burnt out only by the military guard that was um, permanently in, in Rathronan from the National Army, the Free State Army, and threats from the officers to burn Miss Ryan's place in Tom Cool to the ground if mine were meddled with. And that's such a sadness to see that break between two good friends, two members of Common Amman, two women who had fought as comrades during the War of Independence, and now they are on this, these different sides, and there will be no coming back from that, and, and they never speak again. But many, uh, the Civil War leaves a trauma, a trauma, I suppose, that only now, 100 years later, we're dealing with. However, with somebody like Kathleen, a practical woman, a political woman, engaged and interested, the Civil War does not end her involvement in politics. And I think her afterlife is something I'm really interested in delving in with, to, with you today, because it's then Kathleen becomes very much involved in national politics. In many ways, what she was doing prior to 1925, 29 is local politics. It's in Wexford, it's cultural politics. Um, but now she becomes a national figure, a well-known national figure. The Senate women, when the Irish Free State came into being, as I said, many of the women TDs have been anti-treaty, so they lose their seats. When they come back, only one woman, woman is in the Doyle. That's Maura Collins or Driscoll, Collins or Driscoll, Michael Collins' sister. So she isn't um, a, a feminist. She says she'll vote the party line. She doesn't um, vote along lines that deal with women's issues. However, we have six women in the, in the Senate between 1922 and 1936, Kathleen being one of them from 1928, Kathleen Clark, whom I spoke about last week to a group from 1928 as well, Anna Stockford Green from 1922, she dies in 1928 and Kathleen Brown is co-opted to replace her. Eileen Costello, um, who was in there from 22, the Countess of Deshart, uh, who was in there from 22 and died in 1933, and Jenny Wise Power, whom Kathleen would have known very well, also a member of Common Assertia and Common the Gael, later joins Fianna Fáil, but also is pro-treaty. Eileen Costello, Jenny Wise Power, and Kathleen Brown, uh, Alice Stockford Green, uh, Countess of Desert are always pro all pro-treaty. Kathleen Clark is anti-treaty. But this won't matter in many ways uh, when they come to deal with the legislation uh, in the free state. So who, they were very, they were ideologically very separate. Um, Wise Power and Kathleen Brown, Kath and um, uh, were committed, Alan Costello were committed feminists. Um, Alan Costello was an educator, his, historian and nationalist like Kathleen Brown. Both uh, Kathleen Clark, Brown and Wise Power had been involved in Common Amman. However, Wise Power and Kathleen Brown become a pro-treaty, while Kathleen is anti-treaty. They're Catholic, Protestant, and Jewish. The Senate was set up to represent all classes, and indeed, among the women, you do have a diversity. What you know them all, though, really, was um, what? No, sorry. What um, 
came about in the Irish Free State, which I talked about a little bit earlier. The Irish Free State that she uh, found was not a place for women. Um, and they are very much part of that legislative um, opposition to much had been, which was being introduced uh, through the 1920s and 30s that brought certain inequalities in Irish society to women, to workers, to landless labourers. Uh, Kathleen Brown contested the 1925 Senate election on women's issues. This is a very um, interesting um, election. It's not one that is much studied. There is one really good article on it, and it looks into who ran. It was run on a uh, the single transferable vote. They don't do that anymore. It took months to count the electorate. And three women ran in the 1925 Senate election, Kathleen Brown, Patricia Hoey, and Min Mulcahy, one of the Rhine sisters of Tom Poole. Kathleen ran on women issue, on the woman's issue, which is an interesting thing uh, because she was very much engaged in women's issues. Oh, sorry. Um, particularly the plight of farm wives uh, and being a practical farmer herself and understanding the plight of small farmers, of landless laborers uh, and of the farm, uh, you know, income into farms. Uh, she was interested in, in supporting farm wives who made small incomes, often the incomes that kept farms from going under completely, from butter making or egg selling or cheese making. And these were often under threat from uh, government reg regulations. And so she runs in the 1925 Senate election on women issues. Now, this is countrywide election, so she has to go around the country, um, a, a woman from Wexford, making speeches. And if you look at the local newspapers, you can see that she did get around the country quite a bit, making speeches about why she should be elected to uh, represent women in the 1925 Senate. Um, Patricia Hoy is a much more radical feminist in this 1925 Senate, and Min Mulcahy would be more centrist in the 1925 Senate. None of the women were elected in this campaign, which is interesting because um, the electorate did include all women over the age of 21. Uh, the Vintners Association ran candidates and they actually got more votes than the women's, than the women who ran. Maybe women's issues are becoming less of an issue um, during the 1920s. Maybe it's seen that women are now back in the domestic. We don't need to concentrate on women's issues. But that did not stop women like Kathleen Brown continuing over and over again to campaign for the rights for women. And she spent most of her career um, um, giving, uh, you know, supporting these rights for women in the Senate once she eventually gets in there uh, in 1928. So she's in the Senate then from 1928. Few bills which came into the Senate from 1932 until she left national politics in 36 escaped her attention. Along with her stalwart defense of the rights of farmers, her activism in is women's issues and her interest in history and antiquary were her absolute uh, insistence on her main political activism, which was the defense of democracy and political rights. She was Absolutely. She continued to believe that um, the shadow of the gunman was a real issue in national politics and felt that the shadow of violence, and she, she wasn't the only one who felt the shadow of violence continued into the 1920s. And the declining f uh, futures of her party, Common the Goyal, was due in main to the rise of Fianna Fáil. So she becomes vehemently anti de Valera and anti Fianna Fáil. But I want to spend a little time, I suppose, talking about her as a Senate woman. Um, she stood up on the Doyle again and again, and, and she was a great speech maker. She had a loud, and in the newspapers it says, penetrating voice. So she was able to hold her own when she done, stood up to make those speeches. She defended women when it came to the Conditions of Employment Act. She defended women when it came to many other uh, acts that were chipping away at second-class citizenship. And we can see if we study the women in the Senate in the 1920s and 30s, that what they are doing there is really trying to stop this second-class citizenship, unfortunately unsuccessfully, 
that was being introduced into Irish society, that collaboration between church and state that defined Irish women's position as domestic, respectable, marital, and mothering. Um, now, Kathleen never married. She was a, a, a I suppose, a mother, um, but she was also a public woman. And so she doesn't represent that model of respectability that the Irish Free State was trying to, and succeeding to a large extent, to set up as the main model of Irish femininity. Um, she felt that women had a lot to say about all sorts of things and nobody was going to stop her saying it. She equated the rise of Fianna Fáil and those she saw as their natural supporters and allies, the remaining IRA, with a rise in communism in Ireland, and she becomes vehemently anti-communism. And this is where her drowning of the blue blouses comes in. In 1934, she stated that the principal plank of the blue shirt movement is to combat, combat communism in Ireland, as well as freedom of speech, freedom from dictatorship, and she was convinced this was absolutely going to happen with Fianna Fáil in power and the defense of the rights of farmers of Ireland. She'd been anti uh, de Valera in the 1937 constitution. That stage she's out of government because he has abolished the Senate in 1936. Once Fianna Fáil came into power in 1932, she was unstoppable. In January, 1935, the Oireachtas reporter of the Irish Times mentioned her loud and penetrating tones condemning the dole, the free beef and the free mill, which she said the men were, had actually had men actually provoking quarrels with their employers <coughs> in, or, in order to be defed, dismissed and become eligible for government gifts. Few bills which had came in, as I said, escaped her. She even managed to equate the sorry life of Irish farmers with the politics uh, she perceived of allies of Fianna Fáil, namely Soviet Russia. In a letter to the editor of the Wexford Echo in 1933, she stated, I would like to keep out of everything that comes from Russia, if possible, but more dangerous than oats, oil, or anything else is the poisonous propaganda disseminating by those allies of Fianna Fáil, namely the friends of Soviet Russia. I think she might have, there was a bit of hyperbole going on there, but it shows the fierceness of her opposition. <laughs> She hated the economic war. She felt it was destroying rural Ireland and, and she wasn't far wrong in that. She felt it was responsible for the declining fortunes of practical farmers like herself. And in a, Senate, in a speech to the Senate in January 1934, she stated that farmers have learned almost all they, they want to know about the so-called economic war. They've been struggling along for two years. They have little reserves to live on, uh, they had little reserves to live on during the first year, and they have absolutely no reserves now. They're in an, an absolute state of poverty and hardship. It is absolutely criminal for the government to continue on this mad, reckless course. And in many ways, she wasn't wrong. The economic war was devastating the economy, particularly the economy of rural Ireland. And Ireland's economy was mostly, mostly based on agriculture. The policies of the government were bringing ruination to people like wheat farmers, the beet farmers whom she had so worked for to get their industry off the ground, dairy farmers like herself, and ruination especially to farming wives because of the destruction of the poultry industry. So they couldn't have their eggs for their egg money uh, because they relied on this supplementary income for their family. So poverty was a double-edged sword wasn't just the farmers themselves couldn't sell their produce, couldn't export it to England, but the farm wives couldn't sell their eggs locally because nobody had any money to buy them. So it was destroying the poultry industry. She, her main interest though was at this point was defending free, free speech. And she felt in many ways that um, the destruction of Common Gael, which she saw um, in, from 1932 onwards, and the rise of Fianna Fáil was a threat to free speech and democratic uh, institutions. Uh, even though in 1932, the government had handed over peacefully, more or less, um, uh, and, and democratically to the winner of the election, that was 
in the first election, Fianna Fáil and uh, in coalition, and then Fianna Fáil outright. But from 1932 onwards, the public stand she took on the issue, uh, these issues occurred. And by 1934, uh, they could only have been carried out by somebody of Kathleen Brown's dedication to duty and to her ideas and to her ideologies. In 1932, Fianna Fáil entered power on winning the general election, and she claimed they did so on outrageous and impossible promises. It was of grave concern to her that those very people who had threatened to burn her out, and then here you see the bitterness and the trauma of the Civil War, and I would say more trauma. Imagine thinking you were going to be burnt out by the people you'd fought side by side with in the War of Independence, are now in government, while her own party, Common Gael, are in opposition and are a fading force in Irish politics. There's no way they're getting back into power anytime soon. She's also concerned with the upsurge in IRA activity and possibly feeling that, you know, it come, could come back to her front door again. In 1932, the Army Comrades Association, which was uh, an uh, organization of ex-free state army veterans, was set up. It was to counter the threat which the free state army veterans and their allies in Common Gael felt both Fianna Fáil uh, and the resurgent IRA posed to the Democratic Republic, uh, government of the free state and to themselves personally, and that included Kathleen. Uh, in 32, de Valera had rescinded the order passed by Common Gael, which made the IRA an illegal organization and had released many Republicans. And this led to an increase in violence at public rallies um, and um, Common Gael uh, were often attacked. So the ACA uh, sets up as defenders of Common Gael rallies. They had a stated commitment of defending free speech and defeating communism from, which, uh, from perceived Soviet agents and often acted as defenders at Common Gael speakers uh, at public meetings. Kathleen was a, an enthusiastic proponent and supporter of the ACA, as were many of her Common Gael uh, uh, colleagues whose support base was lessening and whose election future did not look positive and who needed to counter the increasing threat of a continuous Fianna Fáil government. We know that she attended a, inaugural, the inaugural dance of the ACA at the Metropol Ballroom in Dublin on December the 16th, 1932. It would have appealed to her social conservatism, her anti-communism and her belief in law and order, as well as allowing her platform for active opposition for Fianna Fáil. By the end of 32, the growth of the ACA coincided with civil unrest and you had many bitter fights between the ACA and Fianna Fáil supporters. Uh, in 1933, the ACA motored the idea of a distinctive style of dress to recognize themselves, and the blue shirt was adopted, hence the term blue shirt. The uniform consisted of a blue shirt with soldier straps and black buttons, and members marched under a blue banner incorporating the cross of St. Patrick. They also began to use the straight arm salute. And of course, this is very much in common with what is happening uh, throughout Europe at this time with the rise of a centre-right uh, fascism, I suppose, and, and centre-right ideologies. It's interesting to see, uh, recently the Italian president, prime minister has been the most right-wing um, politician elected as prime minister since Mussolini. So, you know, sometimes history goes in a circ circular way. In 1933, a surprise election led to a, a, a strengthened Fianna Fáil, De Valera sacked General Ono Duffy as commissioner of the Gordes Sheikh Mania, and then he becomes leader of the Blue Shirts, um, which now includes the National Guard and the ACA and various other um, um, uh, people who are anti-communist specifically, but also anti fall We don't know what Kathleen Brown thought about uh, O'Duffany, but uh, a letter from a friend in Ballyhack and Wexford seemed to indicate some reticence about him on their part. They felt he was brave and intrepid, uh, good as an organizer, but lacks the true qualities of a statesman. There was some question as to his character. Um, however, uh, O'Duffy's nerve did fail him. They were right about his character. In August, 1933, when he called off a blue shirt march at this stage, Common Gael merged with the ACA and the Centre Party to form Fine Gael, with O'Duffy initially was leader, but within the year he's gone, 
and replaced by a really good friend and colleague of Kathleen Brown's, W.T. Cosgrave. And the Cosgraves and the Browns had been very close. So now she is totally involved in Fianna Fáil. She had been involved in the ACA and the blue shirts from the beginning, the blue blouses. In 1934, she spoke proudly in the Dáil of the fact that she'd recruited hundreds of men and women into the organization. Uh, as every post to her home in Rathronan brought letters from people asking her to get involved. In 1934, she challenged the government by insisting on wearing her blue blouse in the Senate and also had vis visitors in the gallery who were similarly attired. They were refused entry to the gallery and she provokes a quarrel between the speakers of the Dáil and the Senate and she then participates in the debate on the wearing of a uniforms restricting bill and gives a staunch dissent defense of the Blue Shirt organization. And it gives us an idea of why she was Im involved in that. It's a political organization. It's a political opposition. It is a movement that is in opposition to a revolutionary body, to the IRA, to a military body whose avowed aim is to overthrow the state by force of arms. She says, we're accused of being fascist. She says, ours is not a fascist movement. And I am not one, though I'm not one who does offer any criticism of fascism. I believe it has done tremendously useful work on the continent. And at this stage, of course, basically the fascism that she's talking about is Mussolini and the black shirts. At the same time, I deny we have any aims in common with that movement other than to combat communism, which is the principal plaque in our organization. So it is her anti-republicanism and her anti-communism in which she expresses in letters and speeches and Senate statements and defending the fragile democracy created by Comme de Gaël, uh, that she is in the blue shirts. The historian of the blue shirts, Mike Cronel, says that while they possess some fascist traits, they were not fascist in the German or Italian sense. They were generally what we would call today social conservatives determined to defend constitutional freedoms from what they perceived to be IRA extremism. For Kathleen Brown, this is what being in the blue shirts was about. It was also about defending the rights of the farming community from which we sprang, for defending the right of free speech and the provision of a stalwart defense against communism and the possible threat of dictatorship. She believed that a democracy needed a fully functioning and strong opposition that could call out. And of course that does what it is what a democracy needs. Because they felt Fianna Fáil in releasing IRA men would interfere with the rule of law, would allow the anti-treaty ice to take advantage and would uh, you know, undermine democracy. They were also very concerned, as I've mentioned, with the economic war and the effect that had on rural Ireland. Kathleen Brown's politics, uh, you know, is very much of its era. It fits with the politics of many people in this period. And when you're looking at women and their afterlives, revolutionary women and their afterlives, some remain centre, some stop being political, some go left wing. Uh, for example, Margaret Skinner, the other woman I wrote a biography of, uh, gets involved in trade union activism and always sees herself as a socialist and indeed ends up being president of the INTO in the 1950s. Others reject the state altogether and have nothing to do with it and remain involved in, in, in active militant republicanism like Elizabeth O'Farrell and Julia Grennan. Uh, others like Mario Comerford remain committed to the ideal of a republic and are more left-wing and remain committed to feminism. Others like Kathleen become more center-right anti-communism is their defining ideology, anti-republicanism, militant republicanism, and a commitment to a socially conservative but equitable Irish society. For Kathleen in particular, it was about defending the agricultural sector, it was about defending the heritage and culture, it was about defending the environment. From the moment of the signing of the treaty, she was fiercely anti-republican, and she denied any concert, connection with fascism. For her, the blue shirt was not a uniform, it was an identification dress, just the same as a football jersey. And that was the absolute necessity of it. 
She was fiercely defended, defensive of any threat to a fully de democratic government. When the Senate was abolished in 1936, she did leave national politics, although she does try for a seat in 1938 in the newly established Shannad, which she as a member of Fine Gael, but she doesn't succeed. Um, her political life could be described as opinionated, ideological, quite successful, and at times reflecting her de dearly held beliefs and ideologies. I think she was happiest when she was talking about history and heritage and culture uh, and her abiding love of Irish history and Irish language. She was committed to this romantic na nationalism. As you can see from the photo there, the Irish wolfhound, the Celtic dress, um, and that really reflects a, a, a certain type of romantic nationalism. She was a great Irish speaker and an expert, as I said, in Yola, a self-trained researcher and antiquarian and historian. Bernard Brown devoted her life to writing a history of Wexford and that of the Browns, so much so that she even had a small private museum in her own house. She wanted an Ireland in which farming would be modern and progressive. She set up the beet industry or helped with that. She uh, was uh, very concerned with environmental policies and the impact on the environment. She needed, she recognized the need to protect our national heritage and promote country life and interests. She had a deep connection to her home place, like many of these women, and was always conscious of Brown history and place in South Wexford society. Rathronan Castle itself looms large in her life and her pride and her love of her place is evident. In her political life, she considered herself a patriot who played her part in events of 1916 and the War of Independence. In 1922, she plays a life in national politics. A friend and confidant of many of its leaders, she was a devoted member of Common Gael and became really anti-Republican. She then becomes a devoted member of Fina Gael uh, and, and continues that all of her life. She never accepted the policies of Fianna Fáil were anything but detrimental to, the, to democracy uh, and particularly to the economy due to the effects of the economic war. Her defense of democracy was strident and her views, though extreme, were dearly held. While the histories of the many women of this period have been recovered, women who are pro-treaty, anti-republican and involved in the blue blouses are often neglected, maybe because of that tinge of, of, of extreme right wing. But I think it's important to research the beliefs and ideologies of those women and men whose politics and convictions led them into organizations like the Army Comrades Association and the Blue Shirts to gain a fuller understanding of the political and social and economic histories of the period. The, rights, the writings and activism of Kathleen Brown gives us some insight into these beliefs and ideologies and she deserves her place in history. An obituary after she died in 1943 stated, and I think this is true, few women in this country have achieved such fame as Miss Brown or Miss Brown as of Rathronan, as she always liked to be called. And her outspoken and uncompromising addresses from public platforms reflected the strength and the sincerity of all her convictions, cultural, political, nationalist, love of land, love environment, love of family, love of history. Kathleen Brown deserves her place in history. Thank you. Thank you, Mary. That was a wonderful, um, informative presentation and um, I've learned so much. I'm, I'm sure everyone here has um, learned different aspects to, to the woman that is um, Kathleen A. Brown. Um, I suppose now it's the most important thing, really. I suppose we we'll go to answer questions and answers. If anybody has any questions that um, came up um, through the presentation, Colin, um, Colin you have one there. I'll unmute you there. Mute. Yes, I'd, I'd like Dr. Mayor to say something about the school books she wrote and her newspaper articles. Yes, she was. Uh, she was. Um... I don't know where she got her energy, actually, <laughs> because, you know, as well as being involved in politics, she was writing books. Um, I think the school books were very much of their time. They were used in, in um, primary schools 
for quite a long time. And, and they do reflect a, a type of history that, um, you know, was of its time and, um, you know, uh, Cromwell as, as evil monster, not that we would deny that in many ways now. Uh, and very, so, you know, particularly uh, interesting to look at written from a Hiberno Anglo or Norman Irish perspective uh, and the Catholic ascendancy, I suppose, that lost its way in the um, 17th century uh, and, and got involved then in nationalist politics. So her heroes are very much male of their time, but they were interesting books. And I think they, they delivered a history that comes from that romantic nationalist perspective. Uh, and then her letters in the, um, mostly to the Wexford Press, but some in national newspaper, reflected her politics. She was defending, you know, farm wives, defending democracy, defending free speech, writing about the environment, the heritage, Yola, whatever struck her interest. She always had an opinion. Uh, and so she would um, constantly engage, in many ways, I suppose, newspapers, but the social media of the time. So it's very interesting to read the letters to the newspapers from both men and women of the revolutionary period and political men and women. They have arguments back and forth in the newspapers. So one week one would write a letter, another would respond, and then another would respond. And Kathleen is very much part of that, writing her opinion, responding to art articles that would be maybe pro Fianna Fáil, or writing about the impacts, the adverse impacts of the economic war, or writing in support of the Gaelic League or the heritage or, or talking about Yola, and then her, her contributions to local society, news or historical society, uh, publications. Um, in many ways, she was she was just a dynamo in her her energy and her ability to be involved and engaged with so much at the period. Thank you. Thank Thanks, you, Helen. Mary. Thank, Thank you. you. Anybody Thank else you. have any questions? Yes. Moira. 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 Hi. I have. Yeah, th that was very very interesting, Mary. Uh, I think. We're beginning to learn kind of the hidden history, really, post-1916 of uh, both men and women, but in particular women. And I'm just wondering, you were talking about people being pro and anti-treaty. Were all parties after the War of Independence, did they want the women to go back into the home, so to speak? Or was there any party that didn't that believed that women had e pure equality? No, there was no party that believed that women had pure equality. I think maybe the Labour Party um, had an aspect of that, although you do find Labour TDs speaking out in support of the Conditions of Employment Act in 1936, in which the Minister for Labour took it upon himself the right to prevent women from working in any industry of his choosing and they talk about the threat of the woman worker to the worker because the worker is always male and then the woman worker is the other worker who is seen because of her low-waged unskilled non-unionized position spoken about in ways i suppose that maybe uh, those who are anti-migrant speak about migrant workers today using that language of threat that uh, because of in, in industrialization and mechanization in factories, you didn't need physical strength to work in, in factories as much anymore. So therefore, maybe the worker would be thrown out and the female worker would be brought in at lower wage to replace the worker. And, and you get those anxieties. But in terms of Common Goyle and Fianna Fáil, no. I mean, when Fianna Fáil come into power in 1932, some of the women who would support Dev and who were anti-treaty and were in Fianna Fáil had some hope that perhaps he would roll back on a lot of the uh, anti-woman legislation that had been brought in through and by Common the Goyle. He didn't. And in fact, Hannah Shee Skeffington said um, the minute he got elected, excuse me, elected, that um, there should be no expectation that De Valera was going to be any better than WT. T. Cosgrave, sorry, I've got the hiccups now. W. T. Cosgrave, um, that he was bourgeois uh, and conservative and Catholic and would treat the women as bad, if not worse. 
And of course, that came to pass because one of the big campaigns of the late 1930s was against the 1937 Constitution and the women in the home articles. Uh, and that really uh, that really brought out a lot of the old feminists, uh, come, old come and man, women who'd been in come and the political women of all shades, right and left, uh, collaborated together to campaign against the 1937 Constitution, unsuccessfully, obviously, because it was passed. And those women in the home articles still remain in our constitution today. So if we start with Come and the Gael, like they bring in the Juries Act, they bring in the, the, the uh, Civil Service Amendment Act, which meant women couldn't take senior civil service exams, which prevented them going above, you know, the lowest entry level jobs. They bring in the marriage bar. De Valera expands the marriage bar. No, from the beginning, the Irish Free State was an anti-woman uh, state. Uh, and, and of course, it had backed up by the ideological and faith-based policies of the Catholic Church. Thanks very much. Yeah, that clarifies matters. Certainly does. Thanks. Thanks, Moira. <laughs> thank you. Thank you, Mary. Uh, Liz Jones has her hand up. Hi, Liz. How are you? Hi. Very good. Thanks for uh, thanks for letting me join. Yeah, I just maybe you mentioned this already. I enjoyed the talk. Um, are there any of her archives, uh, Kathleen Brown's archives, available uh, for public reading? You know, any of her, her research or things like that? Um, I think the archive remains with the family, um, uh, with um, Des and with Bernard at the moment. Um, I, I hope some stage it will be in an archive. Um, there are, I mean, you can find a lot out about Kathleen in the archives by reading the local newspapers. She was absolute is at writing uh, by from her own writings and of course all of her speeches are on iraqthis.ie on the government website so you can read all of those and she also wrote a lot of letters to a lot of the women she knew and men that she knew so they are in their archives like the Hannah Shee Skeffington archive, W.T. Cosgrave archive so you can actually research our, our Kathleen through other people's archives um, and through the Oireachtas, um um, website uh, where her speeches are and newspapers, uh, but I was very privileged in that they also allowed the Brown family allowed me access to the the private family archive uh, and to see um, what they had, and that really informed the book I wrote on her. Okay, thanks. I was yeah, I was particularly interested in the heritage and culture research she had done, and that of Yola, etc. So that was kind of well, she band. published a dictionary of of Yola. Yeah, so there is some publications by her on Yola. And the, um, what is the name of the local history journal that's still going good? Ukinsula. Ukinsula, so she published yeah. a lot in that. Um, she also made speeches um, about heritage and the environment in the Senate, so you can read those speeches, um, and a lot of articles in newspapers about that too. Thank so you. there's a lot of things on public in public archives, as well as the private archives. Thank you. Thank you, Liz. Thanks, Mary. Anybody else have any questions? Yeah, I just, um, do we know of any film or audio exists of Kathleen? I never came across any. Um, I would, I don't think she was ever on radio, uh, but she, it was said she had a very loud voice. She was well able to project um, and and some would would were being, you know, I think a bit mean saying strident, but of course a loud female voice always gets the hackles up of mm. particularly male reporters. So it was called strident. Um, I suppose I could abuse, be accused of having a strident voice myself when I'm lecturing because you have to project. Um, but no, I, I, I never heard. But of course, um, you know, there's still people around today who met her like um, Ivor and um, Tony, do you meet you met her? I think Tony is still there. And, and you to unmute yourself. Bernard, Bernard. Bernard. Can you unmute yourself, Tony? There we go. There we are. No, well, I I mean, she died uh, in 1943. Now I was only four and a half when she died, right. but I do. You wouldn't remember. Uh, my mother would be one of those nieces that you refer to, Mary. There, that yes, she was brought up in the house. Her mother, her sister died in. Yeah. Uh, Whatever it was, and um, how so many my of those children were? Was it four or six? Yeah, five, I think. Five. Five. Yeah. 
So she brought them up with her sister I, Maisie. Yeah. Yeah. Yes. Then they, they sort of she got them up to boarding schools and that eventually. And um, but um, I remember the pony and trap really was the thing it was during the war. And then I remember going with her. All right. I remember going in the pony trap. It wasn't a donkey and cart now. It was a pony and trap. More upmarket. <laughs> you know what I mean? And of course, well, they was, had a big farm, and she was a practical uh, farmer, a successful farmer. You know, they had a huge place, and they fed all the a lot of people working on the farm. And uh, well, I, I think one of my favourite letters in the whole archive was a letter she wrote from Mountjoy Jail in 1916. Mm -hmm. She's a prisoner. Um, she's had a visit from her brother and some material, you know, some comfort like socks and food have been sent up. But she writes a letter to her mother and she gives instructions as to what they're to do on the farm. And I mm -hmm. thought, yep, yeah, that's a woman who knows her own mind. Yeah, it seems to be true, particularly on history too. That you did a lot of the talk about her, but the, the history, I mean, she, to be able to trace us all back to Asia. Oh yeah, she does a lot on the genealogy. She's very proud of her Brown family. The Cromwell, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. Well, sorry, did I say Cromwell? I meant Strongbow. Strongbow was, uh, was yes. uh, came over with um, help for Dermot Dier McMurray Kavanagh and um, uh, Brown Stafford. There was a lot of well-known names: Myler, mm -hmm. Sinnott, mm -hmm. Barry, Barry, some Welshes. But uh, so there were the crowd who came in, and then the marriage took place between. Rambo and Steer McMurray's daughter in Water yeah. Cathedral a couple of days. A couple of days. So, so they anyway. came in, they were invited oh. in to help uh, Dermot McMurray and they decided to stay. Exactly. <laughs> 800 so years I, later, I, 900 I, years later. I sometimes tell people that England didn't invade Ireland, we invited them in. <laughs> home, home. It doesn't go down too well in certain corners that way. No. But, uh, that is like that actually what happened. Yeah. Uh, France had conquered England in 1066. As now the Normans were in charge, and they came in as Normans. You know, so yeah. it was one. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, well, that's that's but, a very interesting uh, part of the history as well. I think that that um, that pride in that heritage. Yeah. Um, is is uh, is also an interesting part of Kathleen's character because, uh, you know, she fitted in that heritage. You know, it 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 was a, a different heritage to your typical Gaelic heritage. Yeah. Um, it is is it's Anglo Irish, it's Hiberno Irish, I suppose, or Cambro Irish, uh, but it there so long in South Wexford that it is indigenous really to the to the parent part of the country then, and there's a real pride in that and a real pride in in her father's career and a real pride in many of her ancestors who battled against subsequent English invasions. Um, so, yeah. Ronan, think, yeah. Thank you, Mary, and thank you, Tony. Ronan, you have your hand up there. How are you? Hi. Well, it's actually Ivor. Hi, Ivor. Hi, Ivor. Hi, Ivor. He wants to say. Okay. Yeah. Hi, Ivor. How are you? Hi, Ivor. Yes. My aunt Kathleen Brown was a great advocate of, yes. of the called Tea Islands. Uh, yeah. a lot of time um, defending the, the, the big island. Yeah. Yeah. And I, I think somebody said, um, uh, what, uh, you know, if she were alive today, I think. I think environmentalism would be of concern to her. I think she was an environmentalist in many ways before environmentalism was, you know, given that term. She was very concerned about the landscape, the the physical environment, and and then protecting the Great Salty Islands, which I really enjoyed seeing uh, when I was down there in Kilmore Key. And and I I'm going to go back to go out. I've never been out, so I want to go back and go out now. It, and pay honour to Kathleen for her part in in protecting the Great Salty. Bird Sanctuary. Mm. Bird Sanctuary, yes. Fantastic. Great. Thank you. Great to see you, Ivor. Thank you. Um, someone else has their hand up there. Um, Just ask you to unmute there. Ask you to unmute yourself. Can you? Mm. No, I didn't um, no, I'm just listening to so many interesting things. Yeah, no, th there, there we, we go. go. There we go. Uh, hi, my name is. Uh, Conrad Hassett and uh, 
I lived in North London, obviously, until I was about 22. And um, while I didn't know, um, I never met Kathleen, I knew her sister, uh, Maisie, uh, and she lived with us. On, she was a grandmother that I never had. I never met any of my grandparents, but um, um, Maisie was a wonderful woman. And she obviously, uh, I suppose, like uh, Kathleen, she was very interested in history and she was a great raconteur as well and so a great um, raconteur. I, I just, raconteur. I just uh, wish that I had uh, paid more attention to her but she did talk, talk about you know 1916 and and the civil war and um, some of the intimidation that they had was um Yes, yeah. um, I, I suppose I downplayed that a bit, but I, I think, did I speak to you when I was doing the book or, or was it your mother? Um, you or somebody in the local area who spoke about the real intimidation that they did get during right. the Civil War, that it was it was quite frightening. Well, I mean, she told about um, uh, the two of them walking down the dock lane but, uh, and being followed by um, people with lights and so forth and but it was uh, quite intimidating mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but uh, uh, she seemed to get over that and uh, I was very very glad I met her uh, she was a wonderful woman and yes. uh, very dear to my heart uh, as I say I never met Kathleen but uh, <laughs> I would have liked to have well, it's good to play, pay homage to Maisie as well because they were they were running the home and the family farm together you know and, and bringing up the children together. Well, yeah, my father was only three when um, his mother, uh, Margaret, died, Kathleen's sister, and the, they eventually uh, brought up all five children. And yeah. my father yeah. then did inherit uh, the farm. Yes. Um, and um, yeah, uh, uh, Rathbone was, yeah, it was quite a, uh, uh, an atmospheric place. We did have that museum uh, up uh, in the mm -hmm. uh, in the castle up on the top floor, which uh, uh, we were slightly frightened of, I suppose, in some <laughs> ways. Uh, but it was lots of wonderful things up there, and unfortunately, it's all gone now. Yeah, that's a shame. Yeah, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Thank you for that, Nikki. As hand up there. Hi, hi, I'm Nikki. I'm Tony's daughter, Tony and Maureen's daughter. Mary, that was just fantastic. Um, uh, uh, I don't know what the word is, but anyway, it was just wonderful. The whole the whole um, talk was absolutely fantastic. So fascinating. Um, and I'm so interested in her now. Like she's she was just sounds like the most incredible woman. And thank you so much for doing all so much history and work um, in, in it. But just what you said about the Salty Islands, um, mm. I'm just going to put it out there. Um, just that if ever you want, if you are going, it would be lovely to get a group, uh, maybe who are people who are interested, and I'd love to go with you sometime. So just wanted to, to put that out there. That's great, Nikki. That's um, that kind of brings me on to the the filming aspect of the project. We could that would be something that I would love to organise with. Um, you know, whoever would like to, as you mentioned, come out as a group out of the Salty Islands, that would be that would be wonderful. So perhaps we we will touch base. I'll keep everyone on the mailing list um, and in terms of communicating and um, the next phase of the project. But that's that's a wonderful idea, Nikki. Thank you. That would be great. Just if you're um, part of it, it's going to be filming, is it? Yes. Um, okay. Colin Brennan, one of our members um, here from the North Wexford, um, singing circle, traditional singing circle. It has taken the challenge on to to write a, a song, um, a newly composed song in the traditional style about um, Kathleen. So that was one part of the project, and the other part is is to um, do a short film piece on her life um, in in terms of incorporating the song, obviously, and it would be great to incorporate community or family in terms of um, the story, making the story. Um, more relatable and you know covering her life in through film as well so so yes I, that... i'm involved in um in the film industry so okay if you need any help i have a company we rent out equipment and cameras and that type of thing so great. yeah I'm more than happy to help great thank, thank you appreciate Colin. That, Colin. thank you Colin. that's great 
That's yeah, great. we like if somebody is if anybody here is interested in being interviewed, um, I'm kind of looking. I'd probably just do a number of short interviews. Um, get yeah, pop yeah, contact us via email and um, and we can arrange that going forward. Yeah, great. And does Colm want to say anything? Yeah, Colm, um, do you want to to say anything about the the song and of what you 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 thought of tonight and in terms of the information that we've. We've all we'll have time. We need time to digest all that and yes, yes, it yes absolutely. Yeah. And and um, well, first of all, just just to say how much I enjoyed tonight. But yeah. but uh, just as important to say how much I enjoyed the biography uh -huh. by Dr. Mary. Uh -huh. um, I was lucky enough uh, to pick up a copy in, in um, I think the only copy they had in yeah, Kenny's in Galway. Yeah. So I had a, a chance to to um, and. I suppose I'm, I'm just uh, brimming over with 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 extra ideas. I've, I've mm -hmm. naturally I've, I've made a start on jotting down ideas and, and so on. Um, and the the challenge now is going to be, uh, I suppose, to edit, yeah. edit a lot yeah. of that, yeah. uh, and to and to and to make a a good traditional song out of it, and yeah. at the same time to make sure that that uh, the the hero of the song. Is Kathleen Brown? Yes. That yeah. that 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 the focus. Uh, we, we we always say on, on, in in traditional singing circles and in Shannos circles that the emphasis must be on the subject of the song, not the singer. The singer, yes. yes. So so um, mm. if if I manage to to convey that that in terms of of or that in terms of of uh, a patriot, a practical farmer, um, a politician. Uh, a historian, uh, a linguist, and so on. If I manage to convey that through the song, I'd be happy. Yeah, yeah. No um, better, no, no better, better person, no better man, Colm. Um, so yeah. Anybody? Any? Any other questions that may have popped up as the evening went along? It's it's kind of one of those evenings where you. Well, there's Marianne. Go Marianne, ahead, Marianne. How yep. are you, Marianne? I I'm bursting with cold here. Yeah. <laughs> you <prefer> um, <laughs> I was going to ask, how did she save the salty islands? I mean, did she own them? No. Um, <clears throat> it was a campaign to just make sure that they were um, uh, protected. So using legislation, and using influence. Um, I, I can't quite remember the detail of it, but it's in the book that Colin has about how she worked on, on the salty island. Perhaps Bernard, do you know a little bit more about that than I do? Just get you to unmute yourself there, Bernard. It was um, Mary, the, the uh, legislation was passed about 1933 in terms yeah, of the Salty like Islands. It was, yeah. it was yeah. around 33, 34. And Kathleen had been very active with uh, Robert Lloyd Prager and others in the in the period beforehand, um, trying to, to protect the Salties. And there's a lot of um, letters that she has written or in the newspapers and that relating to the salties and the um, Irish naturalist uh, journal has a few of her letters as well published it there in relation to the need to protect the wildlife and she was um, certainly um, very uh, much an environmentalist as you said and I think that's something that that we tend to forget when we're looking at her politics and her interest in history and that she was passionate. She was also, as you said, a very progressive farmer mm -hmm. and the farming practices that she yes. advocated in terms of land drainage and all sorts of uh, um, um, innovative ideas and farming in South Wexford was was really important. And the importance of the sugar beet industry, she recognised that from day one. And when the sugar beet industry started in, when was it, 1920, in the mid-20s, yeah. she was really proactive in that. And, and I think she, in many ways that's why she was so angry with the economic war. Yes, oh yes, yes. Yeah. a lot of, 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 of the ideas she'd worked on. Yes, yeah, no, absolutely. She she was really, um, she, she advocated for the, the um, sugar factory. She wanted it in Wexford. Of course, between Mallow and Carlo, that's where it ended up. But she made she ensured that Bridgetown and Wellington Bridge and all the stations were, were able to facilitate the transport of of um, sugar beet. 
and she, she was really um, a strong advocate of that. And she saw the benefits to farming as well of having the rotation of crops and having uh, root crops like that. But in, in terms of of her, um, um, you know, she, she also wrote a history a history of the castles of Wexford, mm -hmm. which was published in the Free Press. And um, a few years ago, uh, one of the former journalists of, of the Free Press. Uh, he said when, when the free press closed down, one of the things that was under one of the counters was a box of um, her manuscript notes on the castles of Wexford. She used to handwrite them all in and bring them into the free press uh, and they would uh, obviously typeset it and publish it. But she was she was uh, she was and really managed to get on hold of that. And uh, I did. Yes. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Hillary Thank Murphy you. gave them to me eventually. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, that, but um, at the time, I mean, she, she was really a polymath in, in, in many ways. In terms of she, had so much, she was also an artist. I mean, she was quite an accomplished watercolorist, and I think Des or Tony or some some of the family definitely, and uh, maybe uh, uh, Khan. And um, th th there are paintings uh, belong to her uh, still extant in the family, and also in Bridgetown. So mm -hmm. she she had lots of. Um, lots of interests and many items from um, Rathrone and also um, uh, A.T. Lucas after she died in 43 uh, A.T. Lucas I think uh, contacted the family and a number of items quite a, a large number of items I think uh, Connellith mentioned about the museum that but also ended up in the national collection uh, there was all sorts of crosses and all sorts of things that came from Argentina, uh, mm -hmm. uh, from the family there, uh, um, that ended up in uh, the National Museum. And they're still there today. And also mm -hmm. the beautiful spinning wheel and um, from uh, Rathronan, which is still in the National Museum. Um, and there's a, are, are they on, on display? Uh, they're not on Early display. Years. No, no, you really, you, Colin, you really have to go uh, and um, uh, um, j just go after them and uh, yeah. try and try and get a look at it. You know, mm -hmm. and that. But it's it's a beautiful specimen, and I know that there is a similar one in uh, where where I live. There was uh, there was one there exactly the same. So it was obviously all part of uh, the scheme that was going on at the time. She was, she was an extraordinary woman in that yeah. she, um, she, I suppose you could see her a bit of a Renaissance character mm -hmm. with all of her, her, all of her abilities and skills. And I would argue, had she been, um, you know, Kevin Brown with all of those abilities and skills, she would be much more of a national figure. Yes, yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think she was, she was very much, she was very much uh, um, one of the forgotten people uh, um, from, from the period, and um, and had remained so until the early two thousands. Really, I mean, she was really uh, uh, very uh, really uh, left out of the um, mm -hmm. uh, the narrative of the county for for generations. And part of it was because she was so unforgiving about the civil war. Yeah, uh, and 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 even within her family, she was unforgiving about the civil war. I mean, she never spoke to my grandfather, and my grandfather didn't take any sides uh, uh, in the civil war. Uh, he refused to, and the two of them had been in the Gaelic League and all the rest of it, but they never spoke again um, after 1922. You know, the bitterness so of that is still an underexplored subject, and how it how it impacted on people. people yes, talk yes, about yeah. Those who reconciled. An awful yes, lot of people yes. didn't. Yeah, 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 yeah. And that's so. Anyway, yes. Thank, thank, thank you, Bernard. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, I think... um, Ronan, um, I think Ivor has a question. Ivor again. Yeah. Great. Thank you. Hi, Ivor. Uh, my aunt Kathleen Brown, she she was bitterly anti Fianna Fáil. I remember after a speech of La Masse, she got sick into a basin. <laughs> <laughs> she felt <knows> that strongly. <laughs> well, you can see that in her in her speech. Yeah. That, that Spanish swine showing his teeth a lot lately. <laughs> yeah, keep going. Keep going. <laughs> Thank you, Ivor. Thank you. Any more? Yeah. 
I had members of my own family who had those opinions too <laughs> yeah. back in the day. Yeah. yeah. Yes. Yes. Anyone oh, else? No. I think I saw. A... Sorry, Ivor. Go ahead. Yeah. She was a very genuine advocate of the Salty Islands and yeah. a great supporter of that. Mm -hmm. So much so that she was kind of a queen of the, the big Salty Island. <laughs> queen of the Salty Islands. I love that line. That's a great line. Mm -hmm. That is a great line. But she was bitterly anti Fianna Fáil. Yeah, yeah. 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 She certainly was that. Okay. Yeah. Well, one thing you mentioned about the Salty Islands, somebody mentioned about the Salty Islands earlier, Mary, and the Browns actually did lease the Salty Islands way back in history. Mm. It's it's in the um, uh, one of the calendars of state papers. Mm -hmm. Okay. Interesting. Do you know where we could find that, Bernard? I'll I'll have a look. I have a reference to it someplace, so yeah. I, I'll I'll find it. Great, thank you. I'd yeah. appreciate that. Thank you so much. Anybody else? Any questions? I I think someone had one in the chat. There was was she a spinner and weaver too? From Rebecca Sweeney. From Rebecca Sweeney. Was I she? Don't think... You don't know, Mary. I don't know if she could use the spinning wheel herself, but a lot of these women in who were practical farmers you know, did a lot of that work themselves or had it done within the farm super, you know, supervising it going on. Could have been her sister that was working on that. Okay. There's a lot of, um, in a lot of the older photographs from the turn of the century, you see a lot of women with, with spinning wheels outside their houses. So yeah, yeah. Obviously they, they did it to earn some extra money or. They did, they did piecework. Yeah. And, mm. and things like that. So. All of those things were very of great concern to her to make sure farm wives had some bit of an income. Because mm -hmm. okay. you have to think of the poverty of the country yeah. at that period. I mean, the Browns were, 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 were fairly well off. They could feed their family. They lived, they had a good big farm. Majority of people were living in extreme poverty. Mm -hmm. So those farm wives with their pin money and their egg money and their piecework that's often what kept a family from extreme poverty and took them up into just normal poverty. So the community at the time would have looked up to her quite a lot, would they, in, in that terms, in relation? Well, she had a lot of political opponents. I mean, she she didn't stand back from any political fight. So, you know, there were those who didn't get on with her, didn't speak to her. Um, but yes, I would imagine she was, you know, a well-respected woman. Yeah. She was Miss Kathleen Brown of Rathrone and she had that respect um, because of all of her activities. So you can see that. And she, she had some great friends as well from the letters I read in the family archive who were the people who were communicating with her. So, you know, I think she was a woman that you couldn't sit on the fence about. Okay. In many ways. Okay. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I've read some of the letters from the that are on from the that she wrote when she was a senator. Uh, it makes for some very interesting reading. Like she's definitely was so opinionated, she didn't hold back. So really, really, really uh, interesting reads there. So yeah. uh, that's brilliant. Yeah. And it would be great to have the song, I suppose, for her voice to be heard, um, yeah. for, the, for this generation and for for uh, going forward. Yeah. No. Um, anybody else? Any questions before we finish? Anything? What I'll do is I'll pop the North Wexford uh, Tradition Singing Circle email in the uh, chat box here. Um, we will keep people on the mailing list going forward now in terms of the project. But if anybody is here that hasn't um, been on the mailing list, we can add you to it if you just pop us a mail in nwtcgloria.gmail.com. There it is there. Okay. Hang on, let's just so I think we'll finish up then. Um, thank you so much, um, Dr. Mary McCullough, for um, such an informative evening. We have so much to digest. I'll be watching this back um, myself to, to, um, to digest it. <coughs> Forgive um, the frog and the truth. I, I can carry on. I'm just coming out of a cold. That's yeah. okay. That's okay. I think I'm going into one. Yeah. Um, 
I, I, this uh, recording, we will put it up on the YouTube channel um, the North Wexford YouTube cha channel and on our website um, so that people can watch it back. And I will send out the link to um, family members that weren't here tonight so that they can watch it back. So um, I just want to thank everybody for coming along. I'm really excited about the project, about the song, about the film, about um, all this uh, information that we've gathered here this evening. And um, yes, I think this is going to be a, a, a lovely project to, as I said, give uh, Kathleen A. Brown the, the voice that she deserves. And yeah. I want to thank the family um, for coming along this evening and contributing um, in, in a big way. And um, I know I've chatted to some of you over on, fo on the phones over the past few days. So I uh, look forward to chatting some more and um, we'll be in touch. And uh, Ihawa, thank you so much. And we look forward to seeing you all again. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. Thanks, John. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Thank you. Thanks, Rachel. Bye. 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 B